The Aurelia Museum of Art and History is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. The Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We respect and observe the long and enduring presence of Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit on this land. Their teachings and stewardship, culture, and way of life have shaped our city's unique identity. It is my pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker for this evening. I'd like to introduce you to Rob McCron. Rob has been a member of the Legion for 23 years. Um, Rob is the Legion Curator and Public Relations Officer. Um, Rob and Rick Purcell have spent two years working on a project to memorialize uh, the role that the Fair Mile played in our local history. And you're going to learn a lot more about that this evening. Tonight, Rob will talk to you about the importance of the Fair Mile. Um, within Aurelia's history. So I'm going to pass it over to you now, Rob. Thanks so much, everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for viewing tonight. Uh, tonight, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, a little ship that made history, especially here in Aurelia. The ship is called the Fair Mile. For those of you who don't know who the Fair Mile, what the Fair Mile is, it, uh, it's a small uh, ship designed in Great Britain by a gentleman by the name of Noel Macklin. Noel Macklin, uh, previously to uh, the Fair Mile, he was a uh, well-known uh, automotive designer and uh, boat designer. When the war, World War II broke out, uh, Noel Macklin was asked to design a small ship that would uh, cruise up and down the coast of England uh, to search for German submarines. Uh, the Admiralty uh, asked him because he was so uh, well known on uh, designing boats or ships. I still call them boats. Most of you probably call them boats. Once they reach a certain size, they're uh, called ships. Uh, the Fair Mile was built as a kit boat mainly because it was uh, easy to, uh, quick and easy to uh, build, and it was easy to ship. It came in pieces, just like your everyday model ship, model cars. Uh, it was quick, and uh, they needed that during the war. By the time uh, the Fair Mile uh, design got to uh, Canada, it was um, changed a little bit in size, mainly because of the Canadian government, government wanted to make sure that it would make its way to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, most of the uh, fair miles were built uh, here in Ontario. Uh, some were built out in the uh, Vancouver area, and some were built down the East Coast in uh, Nova Scotia. The uh, fair mile was uh, pretty well called a sub chaser. It had, um, his purpose was to patrol the uh, east and west coast of Canada. Uh, of course, in 1939, the war, World War II broke out and that uh, we also needed a, uh, a ship that were, could patrol, excuse me, patrol the uh, east and west coast and especially the St. Lawrence. The Fair Mile was a B-class ship. Uh, there was four different classes of ships. Um, the B-class had... Uh, 20 millimeter uh, Oakland uh, guns on it. It had 12 depth charges and the size of it was 112 foot long, uh, 17 feet, 10 inches wide, which is a, they call it a beam. And the draft, which is the depth it would be in the water was four foot, 10 inches. So it could go in shallow water. Uh, it weighed 79 tons, and it was built with two-inch mahogany planks, double planks on the hull, and 
uh, regular planks on the deck. Uh, it was powered by uh, two Hall Scott 630 horsepower gasoline engines. And like I said, it was equipped with 20 millimeter guns, three 20 millimeter guns and 12 depth charges. Originally Hunter Boats was owned by Ditchburn Boats out of Gravenhurst between 1924 and 31. Ditchburn built many pleasure crafts being up in Gravenhurst, but they did have a call for larger luxury uh, boats and they wanted to make sure that uh, they could travel down to Lake Ontario and possibly out to the East Coast. Ditchburn uh, bought some property down here in Aurelia and uh, they built uh, two big buildings so they can accommodate the bigger, uh, bigger boats. Uh, the buildings were uh, built in 1930, I think it was, and um, they lasted till Ditchburn lasted till 1932 when uh, the depression hit uh, mostly all over the world. But uh, in Canada here, uh, a lot of people lost their businesses and Ditchburn was one of them. Uh, late in 1932, a gentleman by the name of Alistair P. Hunter, who was a uh, designer and uh, superintendent slash supervisor at Ditchburn Boats uh, bought the buildings here in Aurelia. As Alistair Hunter was a boat designer, he started his own line of boats, uh, mostly pleasure craft uh, and sailboats. He also built canoes. As it really had a thriving business in the tour industry, it was a uh, big business for the hunters. In 1939, the war, as I said, the World War II broke out. In 1940, the Canadian government uh, put out a contract for any small boat builders that could uh, build the fair mile and that it could uh, make its way down to uh, the St. Lawrence and to the East Coast. Therefore, uh, Alistair decided to sign a contract to build the Fair Mile. The Fair Mile was uh, started in 1940 at Hunter Boats. As a matter of fact, they're uh, the first of seven built out of all the Fair Miles built here in Canada. There was a total of 88 Fair Miles built, uh, 15 built in Vancouver area, seven built in Weymouth, Nova Scotia, and the remainder built uh, in Ontario. The first uh, built by the Hunters was uh, the Q060. Um, the call numbers had to be three digits, and uh, the Q came from, I'm not sure, I'm still uh, searching. Uh, rumor goes that uh, when the Fair Mile reached Newfoundland, uh, they call it a Q boat for some reason, but uh, I'm still searching why it got called a Q boat. Um, in England, they call them MLs with a three digit number. The ML uh, stood for motor launch. The 060 was officially and the only uh, fair mile built in Canada officially named the Mariposa Bell. It comes from the Stephen Leacock's Sunshine Sketches of a Little Town book that he wrote many years ago. As I said, Hunter built a total of seven fair miles. They range from uh, 060, 061, 085, 093, 092 and 0109 and 116. As the fair mall uh, got built through uh, different small uh, boat builders, a group was formed by Alistair Hunter and his son Don. Uh, what they would do, they would meet regular, regularly to uh, create and implement plans to improve the production of the fair mile. 
as they would meet on a regular basis. Uh, they made sure that everybody did the right jobs to make sure everything was put in place to build the, the fair mile. The fair mile uh, would eventually uh, make his way down to the east and west coast. Uh, on the east coast here, uh, th through the St. Lawrence, uh, to the St. John's Harbor, and the Port of Montreal. Uh, the fair miles were uh, aided by uh, two uh, larger ships. Uh, they are mostly supply ships. One was called the a HMCS Provider, and the other one was called the HMCS Preserver. What would they do? They would follow the fair miles up and down the uh, St. Lawrence and along the coast just to make sure that if anything broke down, they'd have the supplies to fix it. They even uh, had a small hospital if anybody got injured and uh, they're uh, an asset to uh, the fair mile. Jumping ahead to uh, 1943, uh, October, exactly October 13, 1943, the Q116, which was the last fair mile built, uh, was in, uh, here at Hunter Boats, uh, just finishing off, uh, getting small things done so it could go on into Lake Coochising for a, a trial run. And then eventually it would make its way down the Trent to Lake Ontario and then uh, down the St. Lawrence to uh, the Atlantic Ocean. The Fair Mile... Uh, was a unique ship, and it was uh, a shame to see the uh, last one being sent off to the sea. But uh, on October 13th, uh, while well, the, the men working on the ship, they went out for dinner, came back around 7 p.m., uh, heard a dripping sound in the hull of the ship, mainly near the engine room. And... Uh, Either the rumor goes it was either a light bulb or a short in a wiring system that uh, caught fire. It was quite the uh, fire. Uh, the uh, Aurelia Fire Brigade was called. Uh, they came about to uh, put out the fire. At the same time they reached there, an explosion occurred. Uh, six men were injured, and uh, one of those men were a young lad, 16-year-old, called Stanley Peacock. S Stanley Peacock was a member of the 99th uh, Lynx Aurelia Air Cadets. He was a student at ODCBI, and uh, like I said, he was only 16 years old. Uh, Stanley, at the time, was looking down the uh, hatch to see what was going on, and the explosion occurred. It blew uh, Stanley right off the ship. The next day, he was found in the water deceased. The men who uh, what were who were injured, their names were Ernest Justin, Reginald Bradley, Russell Hayington, Howard Brougham, Harold Aris, Norman Johnson, John Stone, and uh, they uh, had major first degree and second degree burns and abrasives, and some of them had uh, Scratchers. Uh, incidentally, Norm Johnstone, uh, I happened to find out that he was the only crew member that got injured still living. I got his phone number from his nephew, Jim Pomeroy, and uh, I uh, gave him a phone call. But first, Jim told me I couldn't phone that night. We were talking with each other because his uncle was out curling in a championship round of, of Bondsville curling. And I talked to myself, oh boy, at 95, he must be in pretty good shape. So I asked, uh, asked Norm when I got talking to him, and uh, he said that the, he curls on a regular basis, and he curls like everybody else does, gets down on his knees and uh, pushes the rock like everybody else does. And I thought that was remarkable. Uh, talking with Norm, he was uh, quite enthusiastic about uh, seeing a monument being built here in Aurelia, as he did live in Aurelia. And it's uh, 
would be a great idea to uh, have a monument built on the shores where uh, Fair Mile was built. Norm told me a few stories that uh, I thought was interesting, not only just because he, he curled, but uh, he was with uh, Stanley, right beside Stanley when the uh, fire erupted and the explosion occurred. Norm told me he was lucky enough to uh, jump out of the way and uh, only get uh, minor burns. And uh, he did get burns, uh, first degree and second degree. So that was pretty major. Every year, uh, there is a ceremony for Stanley Peacock um, that uh, we all remembered um, through the newspapers over the years. Uh, services held over at uh, St. James Cemetery um, at the grave site on uh, October 13th. Uh, he was uh, originally, it was uh, organized by uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Ray Rothlaw, who was also a good friend of Stanley's uh, when they went to school. Ray never forgot uh, Stanley uh, for all these years. And uh, he thought it would be a good dedication to have a memorial for Stanley on the anniversary date of uh, the Fair Mile explosion. Just recently, uh, Ray passed away, and I'm sorry to uh, hear that, but uh, we'll continue having a ceremony for Stanley as uh, the years come by. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, fire brigade, which was called brigade back then, now it's called the Aurelia Fire Service, uh, rushed to the site and uh, pretty well got it under control. And uh, I feel that um, reading the article and uh, searching what happened that day, uh, the fire department pretty well saved the waterfront of Aurelia. There was numerous buildings, there was houses, retail stores, and especially there was a uh, Imperial Oil had their uh, supply tanks there. Also along the uh, Lake Shore as uh, we know now it's called the Legion. It was the, the CPR train station that uh, existed back then. Uh, for their bravery, the uh, firemen did receive uh, medals. Um, Captain Robert Elgin Jones and Lieutenant Daniel McLeish. Uh, they received the King George VI Police and Fire Service Medal for their gallantry. Also who received a medal uh, was Ernest Wooding. He was a warrant officer for uh, the Navy at the time, and he was not on the ship, but just off the ship, and uh, he jumped on board to, to help uh, uh, rescue the gentleman. Uh, Ernest received uh, what they called back then the Albert Medal, which is now the uh, George Cross. There's a difference between the Albert Medal and the uh, King George uh, medal. The Albert medal is for life saving and what she did, he pulled two men out of the uh, engine room and saved their lives. And the uh, King George medal was for bravery and gallantry in which the uh, two firemen received. After the war, a uh, hundred boats uh, continue uh, making boats, pleasure boats, that is. Um, as you see in the uh, screen here, uh, there's an artist uh, who lives here in Aurelia, Ada Torrance. She drew a picture of uh, one of the boats that um, Hunter Boats was famous for. They made uh, not just pleasure craft, but they, they made uh, sailboats. And at the time of the war, they are contracted to uh, make uh, a number of uh, crafts for the uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force. Don Hunter took over uh, 100 boats after uh, Alistair had uh, passed away. Um, through the years and into the 70s, uh, with a uh, declining demand for wooden boats, and this is when the fiberglass became the norm for, for boats. Uh, 
uh, Hunter Boats um, had to close their uh, business. In 1990, October 23rd, Hunter Boats caught fire. Uh, it burned right to the ground, and uh, that was a shame that uh, these buildings uh, do not exist anymore. Uh, from what I understand, the uh, city of Aurelia bought the land, and now uh, that uh, if you've been down to uh, by the Legion, uh, it's called Veterans Park, and the skateboard is down there, and um, it is um, where Hundred Boats was. Um, you'll see on the screen, there's a pathway that goes uh, just past the uh, a monument, the soldier's monument uh, that was installed a few years back. And on the left where you see the arrow, uh, that's pretty well where uh, Hunter Boats uh, had their buildings. As a matter of fact, if you just so happen to be down in the park there, you'll still see the pylons in the water where uh, Hunter Boats sat. Between Rick uh, Purcell and myself, we're work we've been like I said earlier, we've been working on a uh, the monument to memorize the tragedy and heroism that occurred the night of October thirteenth, nineteen forty three. This is a special. This is truly historical story that needs to be told by way of this monument and about Aurelius history. And this monument will be uh, a four-sided monument uh, when it's all drawn up, and uh, it will tell the story of the Fair Mile Hunter Boats, Stanley Peacock, and the fireman who uh, saved Aurelia's Lakeshore. Through a donation, you can keep this story alive, which will pass on to generations to come. Uh, we would be grateful if you could send a donation to have this monument built and you could send a, a, a donation to the Aurelia Legion in care of the Aurelia Legion, the Fair Mile Fund, and the address is 215 Mississauga Street, Aurelia. Uh, any donation would be grateful. Uh, I really like would like to see this uh, monument built to tell this historic story. For those who don't know what the Legion is, um, the Royal Canadian Legion has 1,350 branches across Canada, 400 branches in Ontario alone. The Legion serves vet mainly serves veterans, defense veterans, and military, along with the RCMP. They serve their families to promote remembrance, to serve our communities, and uh, with your membership, uh, you can help uh, the Legion survive and uh, do the things they do the best. Like I say, they uh, help out the community as far as uh, local. We do youth programs, help those in need. Uh, example, uh, we give money to uh, Soldiers Memorial Hospital. Uh, we give money to the Lighthouse who uh, uh, houses uh, homeless people, and uh, we have a number of programs for youth, and uh, we have um, served the, uh, we have a Legion Baseball League, et cetera. So uh, if you get your membership, uh, it also gives you perks. Um, the National Legion as a command has a uh, partner together with a number of brand named uh, companies and uh, retail stores uh, to give uh, us Legion members a discount. And uh, if you uh, do buy your discount, you'd have to uh, put in your number and uh, every month they have a, a special uh, deal going on. So join the Legion. It's fun. Uh, we have one of the best views in uh, Canada, uh, right on Lake Kuchiching and uh, drop down, say hello. The legacy of the Fair Mile is very important. Why we remember it, it was a little ship that 
help save the war and give us our freedom we have today. The Fair Mile uh, has gone unnoticed for too many years and I feel that uh, it should be a um, little ship to be recognized. The Fair Mile uh, did an important part during World War II and uh, I'm sure uh, at that time everybody was grateful those ships were built. Awesome. Uh, so from Janet, why do you think this story of the Fair Miles and the firefighters' heroics isn't more widely known in Aurelia? Well, until uh, I guess uh, myself and Rick Purcell came along, along with Ray Ratflap, uh, nobody would have known about the, the Fair Mile. Um, incidentally, uh, I found out the Fair Mile through Ray. Uh, when we went to the uh, grave site ceremony um, a few years ago. And then I, I wrote the story on the, I searched and I wrote the story on the fair mile. Um, so we have a question from Trish. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, sorry, me, I mentioned that Rob is the curator at the Legion. So um, Rob, can you tell us a bit about the artifacts that you have at the Legion? What's your collection like? Yeah, at the uh, War Museum. I'm. Uh, I got the collection of, uh, or we have the collection of uh, many artifacts. Uh, numbers I can't tell you. There's hundreds, uh, anywhere from uh, swords to guns to caps to uh, homemade. Uh, they call it trench uh, artifacts. That uh, when the men were bored sitting in the trench, they would uh, make out of. Uh, uh, bombs and uh, different shells, uh, different things. Uh, we also have uh, a number of uh, model ships in the Navy room that incidentally, that's what I do. I build model ships in my spare time and uh, they're in the uh, museum also. Uh, I got a little bit of a tour with Rob the other day uh, when I stopped in to get a couple of photos for the presentation. And it's a really amazing collection. Um, I guess on that note, Rob, can can anybody stop in and see the collection? Yes, anybody could stop by. Uh, we're open uh, from noon till uh, 6 p.m. Uh, weekly. Uh, during the weekend, I think it's a little bit later. You'd have to phone the office um, at our branch 34 in Aurelia. Uh, the phone number is 705-325-8442. And you could ask them uh, the times uh, where you're open. Yes, you're most welcome to come in and watch. Matter of fact, we have one of the largest uh, uh, museums of uh, these type of artifacts uh, in Ontario. Um, so there's a question uh, from someone that says, why was the fair mile built with wood and not steel? Great question. Yeah, that is a great question. The fair mile was built with wood mainly because uh, steel was very scarce. Uh, the Defense Department's uh, pretty well in Canada here and all over the world. Uh, we're using steel to build tanks, trucks, jeeps, and of, of course, uh, other metal products they needed to uh, in the war. Now, these were all wooden boat builders to begin with. Did that have anything to do with it, do you think? Uh, not really. It's a fact that... Uh... They decided that wood wouldn't be so scarce and that uh, the call for uh, these uh, professional, uh, pretty well professional carpenters and woodworkers, uh, they are more abundant to uh, come along and uh, help build the fair mile. Okay. Um, we've got a comment here from Edwin uh, that says, oh, I it just moved on me. Hold on. Hold on. There we go. 
uh, no idea. My first 20 years of life were growing up in Aurelia and swimming and fishing in the waterfront. While I recognized the hunter boat buildings and rolling boats, I never knew of this history of the Fairmouth. Thank you very much. I'm with you, Edmund. I grew up um, in Aurelia and had no idea that we had this incredible history right on our waterfront. Um, Edwin also says, what is your expected budget for the monument project? The expected budget would uh, be uh, roughly $20,000. And uh, we're hoping to raise that by October 13th on the 80th anniversary of uh, this uh, fair mile uh, explosion. Um, a question from someone who I think may know you says you built a model of the fair mile. One of the things you can see in your collection, right? Uh, can you tell us about that? The model of the fair mile I built, main reason was to show what it was. And uh, if anybody asked to talk about the history of the fair mile, um, I put it in our museum. I, uh, if I'm talking to uh, different groups about uh, the fair mile, <coughs> explosion um i take it along with me uh to uh, show the people in a way what it really looked like uh unless you were you're really there to see where the guns are and the little different things that were on the uh, deck of the fair mile you can maybe visualize in the picture but to see it in the model it kind of gives you more idea of what it was um, we have another comment here from Dave who says, great topic. Glad I saw this and signed in. My dad worked one summer at Hunter's building a fair mile when he was 16 years old. I grew up at my grandfather's cottage at Bay Park and fondly remember visiting Hunter's and Buchanan Motors down the road with my dad in the late 1960s. Thank you. And I will drop in when in town. Uh, visit Rob and come visit Oma too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, a question from Deanne. Do you know if there are fair miles that are preserved or still in use in some form or fashion? I was wondering this also. I looked that up, and as far as I know, in Canada, we have no fair miles uh, that are um, still in the water. Uh, down in Port Dover, just not too long ago, maybe five years ago, six years ago, uh, there was three of them down there that uh, eventually rotted and sunk. Uh, I understand um, three or four were restored in uh, England and they're uh, be made into luxury liner, not luxury liners, but luxury boats being 112 feet long. There, there's a lot of room in there to call luxury. Um, that's the only ones I uh, do of. Okay. Um there's another question that's come in in relation to uh, just the model that you built. Is there another model of the fair mile at the Aurelia City offices? Yes, there is one, a, a rather large one to scale. I guess it's about eight feet long. It is um, at City Hall. If you go into City Hall, turn left, go down the hallway, it uh, you'll see it there. Okay. Um, so... Another question here, was it difficult for the fair miles to navigate the Trent Severn waterway? If Mr. Hunter had to uh, had change the design of it, probably yes. Uh, he shortened, uh, he, um, shortened it and he uh, made the width about a foot smaller because the Trent waterway is, if I understand, is 22 feet wide and uh, 18 feet, uh, the original design, 18 feet, 18 foot six, I understand would be pretty close to uh, maneuvering down the uh, trend. Um, all right, what uh, what naval class of vessel was the Penetang 88? Do you know anything about that? No, the Pen I'd have to look that up. Um, so similar to what you said before, what happened to the decommissioned fair miles? The decommissioned fair miles, uh, I also found out that uh, it took roughly $80,000 to build the uh, fair miles during the war. Uh, when they were decommissioned, uh, some went for training to the mid-50s, 
and then they were uh, decommissioned there. And uh, most of them were all sold off, believe it or not, for $3,000. That's a far cry from $80,000. All right. Um, can you expand on the role the firefighters played that day to save lives and property? I can give you a, a rough idea from when I searched was uh, that the um, firemen, when they got there, there was a, uh, a naturally a, a fire already uh, had begun. They, um, I don't know how many trucks they had back then, but uh, the uh, Apparently they put out the fire pretty quick, uh, just uh, before the explosion. Um, it's uh, no matter what they did, which was significant to save the waterfront of Aurelia. And a massive risk to their own safety. Oh yes, yes. That's um, any firefighter risks those his life to uh, when he's uh, gone to a fire call. Now you mentioned to me as well, which I didn't realize that Ferma Q116 had just been fueled up. Is that right? Yes. Um, it just been, like I said, it was going up for, ready to go for maneuvers on Lake Kuchitsing and then uh, head down to uh, the next day down to, uh, towards the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Uh, they just filled up with 2,300 gallons of high-octane gas because the uh, all Scott engines were run on gas. Uh, later on, some of the fair miles were uh, uh, equipped with uh, diesel engines, as most uh, um, naval vessels are today. Um, all right, we have a comment from Wendy who says, uh, thank you for helping us learn about and remember yet another piece of Canadian World War II history. Very interesting, which I agree. Thank you, Wendy. Um, all right, and a, a couple of questions here from Therese, um, who says thank you, first off. Um, so much history in Aurelia, and I'm pleased you are bringing this hidden history to the present. What fundraisers will the Aurelia Legion be having? to raise the funds to honor those in the explosion. Start with that and then I'll get to the second part of the question. Okay, as of right now, um, fundraising uh, I've been doing and Rick Purcell, our president, um, I've been going around talking to different service groups. Um, after we, uh, I finished talking to the service groups, um, we will go public. Uh, through the media and uh, ask for donations. Uh, right now, we have uh, nothing planned to uh, uh, raise money as of yet, but uh, things were in the works, so we're having a meeting next week to find what else uh, we can uh, raise money to uh, get this monument built. Great. Thank you for your call, Therese. Um, and the second part of Therese's comment or question here is, um, how long would it have taken to build a fair mile and have it shipped out? Okay, uh, the fair miles were built in record-breaking time. Uh, matter of fact, the uh, Hunter Boat Works uh, built seven fair miles in the side of three years. So that's a little over two boats a year, and that's two ships a year, pardon me. Um, that's pretty quick to build a, a ship. Um, and someone says also, what was being protected by the fair miles? The uh, fair miles were out uh, to protect the uh, cargo ships and supply ships were going, to, which were going to England. Uh, as uh, some of you, if uh, you know World War II history, um, England was getting bombed by the Germans and uh, pretty well destroyed. And uh, they had nothing as far as... Uh, Food goes, supply, any kind of supplies. And uh, Canada was uh, one of the only countries that uh, on a regular basis sent over cargo ships and supply ships to uh, supply uh, England with uh, necessities. Uh, well, it looks like that is all our questions for the evening. Okay. Um, we bombarded you enough for one night. So <laughs> thank you so much, everybody, for your questions. Thank you again, Rob. Uh, for your time. This has been 
uh, fascinating. I decided to build a model of the fair mile because uh, it's a part of Arroyo's history. It uh, should be shown no matter whether it's a model or talked about. It was a, a part of history during World War II that uh, it played a big part in World War II. It uh, saved us from uh, the Germans coming into Canada by way of the St. Lawrence and along the east and west coast. It was a little ship compared to uh, the destroyers and everything. It was only 112 feet long. But uh, up and down the St. Lawrence and along the coast, it uh, sure scared off the German submarines. So upcoming in our speaker series, uh, we will have guest speaker Michael Hill on June 21st who presents 60 Years of Mariposa. Uh, with the recent p passing of our beloved Gordon Lightfoot, who was a regular um, entertainer participant at the Folk Festival, as well as the uh, festival um, um, happening this summer in July 7th. It's very fitting for uh, Mike to uh, be our guest speaker uh, to learn about the history of one of Canada's iconic cultural events its roots in Aurelia and the many interesting people involved in staging the Mariposa Folk Festival. So be sure to join us. I've always loved Canadian history and I've always loved writing. And I was a coordinator when I worked, now I'm retired. And so all those three skills come together as a coordinator of the History Speaker Series. Plus I meet like-minded people who love history. And Alma is amazing, and I've learned so much about history, about people. I've gotten to know many people, so it's been an excellent experience. When I got involved in the History Committee, I realized I didn't know much at all. So over the years I've been doing it, I've learned so much about our local history, like the Fair Mile, um, Elizabeth Wynne Wood, um, and Maybe I wouldn't have learned that if I hadn't become involved. So it's broadening my mind and making me appreciate the wonderful history we have in this area. It dates back many, many years, of course, with the indigenous peoples. And uh, there are a lot of stories over that time and dating right back to the beginning and then going on forward. Uh, there's so many stories um, about the local history, the history of the Romero Township, which was Mara, or Madani, which was Madani. Um, and there's just so much that you di don't even have to dig uh, to find out the stories. And that's what the history speakers, they're experts on what they talk about. They have passion for what they talk about. And they want to share it. And we want to know about it. And we're being it's being recorded for future generations, which is really important as well. The history committee is important as well. And what they do is they recruit the speakers, and I do as well. They identify in their experiences uh, speakers who will really bring a lot of good to OMA, and, sh and it's worth sharing. And uh, example, Lindsay is, was in connection with Rob McCrime through the Legion because he was the curator and she knew his passion about the fair amount. So she recommended him as a speaker. You can imagine there's lots of moving parts that have to be done, so I have a critical path of tasks. It lists all the tasks that have to be done. Uh, we have to do the publicity. I have to get the information from the speaker and the pictures. We have to write articles. I write articles, the history committee write articles to promote the speakers and also after they've spoken to get people who have missed it to click on the link and, and see it for themselves. And that's turned out to be very good because our, with COVID and on Zoom, people from all over can see them and have, they have seen them from Australia and England, depending on the, the, the topic. So um, there are all these tasks and I have a tracking mechanism to make sure they're all done. And I also have a publicity plan. And I advertise on uh, websites. We have connections that we've made over the years who will share 
our publicity poster, which is one of the tasks. I get the information and the photos from the speaker and I have a template that I fill out. And then Monica, our operations coordinator at OMA, she, she makes this beautiful poster. And so I can send this electronically or I can post it on bulletin boards. And for example, this one coming up on June 21st, um, I was able to get the Mariposa Folk Foundation to put that on their Facebook page. And they also have it in their office here up the street from OMA in the window. So wherever key, key uh, people would see the poster, especially electronically, uh, depending on the topic, like um, for the one about the fire college, I sent it to the fire marshal's office, I sent it to local fire departments. Uh, you know, that was in particular to that talk. So I tried to identify those. Um, with Wynn Wood, it was the uh, Ontario Art Gallery, McMichael, uh, National Art Gallery. All those, even if one person sees it and decides to look at the talk, it's worth it. Um, not everyone is as passionate about history as the members of the History Committee or OMA, but these are stories about people that maybe you know, that you've known in the past, like the Fairmount. Uh, Rob talked about the gentleman who survived it. And when I posted this on uh, Aurelia Past and Present, which is a Facebook page uh, operated by Marcel Russo, I had comments like, my uncle worked on that ship. And you know, like, you don't realize how connected you are to the history of the area. I do a little bit of everything, so I'm involved in a lot of the promotions for upcoming events, um, programming, uh, a lot of the summer camp uh, logistics, as well as any registrations for any events such as the history speaker. I answer inquiries that come in over the phone, handle building maintenance, or oversee it rather, make sure that everything's being looked after and the internet is working. I have strong roots in Aurelia. My I grew up visiting my grandparents on Bass Lake, and now I live on Bass Lake. Uh, but uh, before that, my great, great uncles were the Dumbbells, or were um, two of the founding members of the Dumbbells, I should say, Alan Mert Plunkett. Um, so I really wanted to get back here one day. Uh, but my background is in administration, um, business administration. That's where all my experience was. So this uh, job popped up and I applied for it. I thought it'd be an excellent mix of, of my experience and my passion. And here I am. The Dumbbells were a uh, comedy vaudeville troupe. So my grandfather, um, his uncles, uh, so his dad's two brothers, Mert and Al Plunkett, uh, started this this comedy troupe uh, sort of to bring up the morale for uh, people overseas. And so I like to joke that I come from a long line of cross-dressers. Um, so Marjorie was uh, the one of the focal ladies, but she was played by um, one of my great uncles. Um, and I really should know more about this. I'm hoping that we'll do a history speaker uh, on them one day, but I know we are planning to do uh, an exhibit in late 2024 on the dumbbells. Uh, so the first step is to set up the web page, which includes a ticketing link. Uh, our events are free, but donations are encouraged. Um, so the ticketing link just shows us how many people we expect to come, and it helps us keep track of the numbers and, and helps us, you know, identify where we need to promote if we need to do further promoting with targeted emails or uh, reaching out to different clubs based on the topic for the month. Um, and then I'll create the poster, like this one you can see there. Um, and that poster, the design was sort of thought up by uh, the late Phil Jackman, who I take a lot of inspiration from in my work here at OMA. So we really do have an excellent balance of both history and art. So if you come on down, there's going to be something for everyone, whether you're interested in local history or you want to see some new art pieces from um, local artists or from more nationally known artists, such as um, Charles Pachter, Elizabeth Winwood. There's quite the variety here, and it's always changing. So I always recommend people come not once, but multiple times throughout the year to see what we have going on. I run the uh, the programs that we offer. 
I curate the exhibitions that are history based and I take care of the collection, which is where we are currently. We have about 21,000 artifacts, everything from little buttons, pins, to larger objects like a birch bark canoe. So, um, yeah, and I have a partner here who runs all the art side of the building. Yeah, so sometimes we do crossover, and my favorite projects, to be honest, are the ones where we get to crossover. Um, I mean, you know, we, we have our, our separate parts, but she's good at letting me infuse a bit of history into her art programs. And a lot of my history programs have a touch of art to them. So I think we strike a nice balance. Um, I've always been passionate about history. History is just storytelling. Um, and who doesn't love a good story? So, uh, and these ones are true generally. So um, I, I grew up the child of a history teacher. So I, I sort of didn't have a choice uh, on family vacations and trips. There was always a, a living history museum uh, or a museum to go to. Um, and so I, I realized that I wanted to work in history. And then I was fortunate enough to end up working in a museum in my hometown um, during COVID. So I got really lucky and I've, I learned something new about Aurelia every single day that I'm here. Um, even having grown up here, I still learn something new every day. So we have two pieces of the Weirs in our collection. They have been radiocarbon dated to um, well, the weirs themselves have been radiocarbon dated to between 500, um, oh gosh, it's been a while since I did these numbers, 500 years ago and 3,000 years ago. So they're older than the pyramids. Um, this is evidence of human civilization in our community for thousands of years. Um, and there was a portage spot right near the weirs. So people would come here and stop off uh, and stay and that was how um, news was transmitted and culture and technology and trade was transmitted but the weirs themselves um, trapped fish in a harvest every year so this was actually a really sustainable fishing method because the stakes would be put in the mud close together but little fish could still sneak through so if they were too small to be worth eating they could leave and grow and come back next year when they were actually big enough to be food. So the History Speaker series predates me. Um, I came on here just a couple of years ago and there was a History Speaker series before I began, um, but it had always been in person and run by the History Committee as it still is. Um, but during kind of the, the later years of COVID, um, we realized we weren't going to be able to have a pile of people in the building, um, so we went virtual. And it's actually been really rewarding. Um, I mean, we have this great partnership with Rogers TV that we're so fortunate to be able to do, but also we're reaching people that are not in our own time zone for the first time. We're not limited by winter driving um, or a capacity limit in the building. So it's been great. We're getting audiences that we've never reached before. It's incredible, um, and that's why I say I learn something new here every day. There is so much to learn. Um, Aurelia is an old city, like within a fairly young or young established country. We're, we've been around a long time. Um, there was an indigenous occupation here for forever um, with the Narrows uh, and the Mijikining fish weirs. We know that there has been human occupation here longer than the pyramids have been around in Egypt. Um, and then when the first non-Indigenous immigrant arrived here in the early 1800s, the city uh, grew from there. We have a wealth of um, Indigenous culture and Indigenous influence. Um, we have amazing artists. Um, we, are, we are a community of about 30,000 people, and we have um, an inordinate amount of talent in the arts and in writing and writing about history. There is so much, and it's, it is astounding how much history we have 
in a relatively small city. We do have a really talented local history community and genealogy community, so sometimes it's just networking. Um, we also send out a survey after every talk asking people what they are interested in learning about. And sometimes we pull topics from that survey that people have suggested and we say, oh, I know so-and-so is an expert on that. Let's ask her if she will come in and talk about it. So it's a bit of a mix of ways. Um, our most recent speaker, Rob Macron, um, he, I met him a couple of years ago, and he's been really active in the community, working on this Fair Mile project and the, the monument. And so um, the Fair Miles have come up a couple of times in that survey that people want to learn about them, and it just lined up well with Rob's um, activity locally. We have a great museum here. Um, we, we are the Aurelia Museum of Art and History, so I think we've managed to strike a really nice balance. Um, our exhibits uh, transition every few months, so there's always something new to see. Um, we recently had an exhibit on about Andrew Tate, uh, who was alive in Aurelia in the late 1800s, um, and he was Aurelia's first millionaire. So we have a, a range of topics from um, really local topics like that. His family is still here in town. Um, to broader topics, we have um, we have one coming up <clears throat> later on about a local theater company celebrating their 50th anniversary. Um, so it all relates to Aurelia in some way, but we get quite a range of, of topics. Um, and then the art shows are just spectacular. We have so much talent here in Aurelia. Um, the Women's Day show is on right now, and it's uh, an incredible exhibition. So um, there's always so much to see. Even the building itself is an artifact in a lot of ways. It was built in 1894, and the clock tower was added, uh, ending in 1916. So it's, it's this artifact all in itself with so much to see and learn about.